Thanks, Jim. Um, we have a unique group here today, so we have a lot of people from the Alliance Advisor Group, but some great external strategic partners. My name is Matt Vahieu. I work closely with Jim and the rest of the leadership team here at Alliance Advisor Group. I want to retroactively maybe give you context to who Jim Lake is. So he's head of sales distribution for Guardian Life Insurance Company throughout the whole country. So he works with Guardian's 50 general agencies throughout the country, so we're very fortunate to have Jim here today. I'm up here though to introduce uh, founders and owners of Empowered Mastery and best-selling authors of You Have Infinite Power, Paul Malella and Chris Burlow. Empowered Mastery is a personal and professional development center focusing on coaching programs and training methods designed to catapult your life and career to the next level. I can personally attest that these two individuals have had a massive impact on many of the people in this room, a lot of our top talent in the organization, and me personally. You know, I'm a better, better professional, husband, father, because of these two guys, Chris notably. So, bef you know, before we get too far, I'll, I don't know where Paul is, but introduce Chris Burlow and Paul Malella. Thanks. That's awesome. I'm going to turn this one off, right? Put my clock on. Uh, there we go. Good. Sometimes I'm a little slow to get start, but then once I get rolling, it's all good. There we go. Good. So first, thank you so much, and I'm so excited and honored to be here. Yes, my name is Chris Burlow. I also go by the name of Grandmaster Chris Burlow. Uh, I'm a lifelong martial artist, seventh degree black belt in Taekwondo, and I have the opportunity to take some of those values we do in the martial arts and bring them to people such as yourselves. I was so excited to see the agenda until one thing happened. When I saw that Jim Lake was speaking, I was like, oh my goodness, how do I follow that act? Can we give Jim another hand, please? He is one of, in my the most inspiring and impressive human beings that I've ever met. Met somebody with such an incredible work. I'm honored to follow you, but also nervous. <laughs> but anyway, I also want to thank Jim and Matt and Steve and the rest of Alliance Advisory for giving us the opportunity to be here. Um, you have my whole hard commitment for the next time that I have with you. I'm going to give you everything I have, and hopefully by the time you're done with my little talk, I'm going to warm you up for Paul Malella and the rest of our speakers. Sounds good? Okay, so the name of our t uh, talk today is going to be a contender or a champion. I've always been an incredibly competitive person. The last number of years, I've had the opportunity to climb some pretty big mountains. 2017, I climbed Kilimanjaro. Anybody ever climbed Kilimanjaro? Oh, nice job. Uh, last year, I got to climb uh, Tevers Base Camp in Kalabatar out in Nepal. Anybody ever do that one? Okay, good. <laughs> And then this year, I was in Ecuador and climbed Cotopaxi. Cotopaxi is one of the largest active volcanoes in the world. And it had big crevasses, and we were roped in. I almost died. It was awesome. <laughs> My brother and I would go climb these mountains. My brother and I would run marathons together. And there wasn't a time where I try, I'd never, where I, there wasn't a time where I did not try to beat him. Anybody know what I mean? We would go through a marathon and make the agreement, uh, just we did Niagara Falls a couple years ago, running, okay, we're going to stay together, right? Yeah, we're going to stay together, right? And we're running the whole way, and there's the finish line, and I bolt. Because I had to have my name in front of him. Can anybody relate? Yes, okay, good, right. Um, who here loves competition? Raise your hand, good. Who here loves to win? Aha. Uh -huh. Who here believes that everybody should get a participation award? Oh, thank goodness. I'm in the right room. <laughs> That's the challenge we're facing now. Yes, the name of the talk, like I said, is Are You a Contender or Are You a Champion? And I'm going to share some stories of my life as I evolved from a contender from my youth to what I believe the mindset that I hold now. I'm going to shoot back 30 years. It's 1989. I was a Taekwondo competitor, an elite Taekwondo competitor. Um, who here was born in 1980, around before that? Who here is after 1989? Oh my goodness, okay. Uh, 1989, 
I had won the state championships, New York state championships. When you go from the state championships, you qualify for the national championships. National championships, I fought at the weight of 127.6 at bantamweight. I am definitely not 127.6 now. Packed on a couple of pounds, but that was my weight class. At the national championships, there were 60 people, 60 men in my divisions, ranging from the age of 18 to 30, I think, at the time. So at the nationals, it was in Columbus, Ohio. My second nationals, my first national I ever fought at, I got injured, so I had to bow out. So I trained really hard for this event. Uh, I won my first fight. All great. I won my second fight. Things are looking really good. My third fight, I kicked the guy so hard, he just walked right out of the ring into another ring, and then eventually came back, and I beat him. I won my fourth fight. And I'm sitting there, and my coach is excited. I'm kind of excited. And he sits, and I'm in the, I'm in the chair, right? He's coaching me. He's talking to me. And he looks at me and he says, only two more fights to gold. And I didn't care. I meddled. I knew I solidified a bronze medal. I knew I took third place and I was going to be on the medal stand. And it's not like I stopped fighting. It's not like I didn't try, but I didn't. I wasn't hungry anymore because I meddled. And that's where, looking back retrospectively, is where I realized, wow, I wasn't, a con I wasn't a champion back then. I was a contender because I didn't finish the job. Can you think about a time in your life where you didn't go all the way as far as you possibly could have? Anybody? Was it just me? <laughs> OK. Right. Holy frustration, right? So now. As a, since I placed third place, I got to go into the, they would take the top three people, the uh, top four, two wild cards, which was somebody else who just had a really big name in Taekwondo, the Olympic training, Colorado Springs. You have a round robin where everybody fights everybody else, and the top person goes to, is, represents the United States, travels to Korea, second place, uh, travels to Germany on the beach. Third place goes home. Guess what place I took? Third place. It's not that I didn't try, but I wasn't as hungry as I should have been. Then they take the top four people. They send you to, I forgot where, but it's the, it's, um, the U.S. Olympics Festival, which is like the, U the Olympics within the United States. They take the top athletes in every Every division, you go there, and you do another round robin, and guess what place I took? I took third place. So I may have been a New York State champion, but I did not maximize potential. I was a contender. Is everybody with me? Fast forward 25 years. <laughs> it took me 25 years to figure this out. I'm now a competitive mountain biker. Any mountain bikers out there? Are there any hills in Buffalo? <laughs> I love mountain biking, right? I love the thrill, the exhilaration, being outside, nature, like almost like crashing and dying and keeping going. It's the best feeling in the world. So I'm a competitive mountain biker. And we have about, we were in the New York State series. And I was in the New Jersey, New York, and Tri-State Area series. And uh, I was doing really well. I was winning or coming in second but winning, and I was like the person to beat in my division. I was in the 40 to 49 year old class, and I was so confident that there would be all the riders lined up. I would walk my bike up in front of everybody and go back in front and just place myself in pole position, first place, because I knew I was gonna win. The guy next to me, hey Chris, how are you gonna do today? I go, huh, I'm not only gonna win our class, but I'm gonna pass all the 30 and 39 year olds, and I'm gonna beat them too. I did. It was all about mindset. I was so pumped, so inspired, had such a level of confidence that whatever bicycle was in front of me, I was going to pass it or I was going to die trying. I finally tapped into that championship mindset. Then I fast forward another four years to this year. 
I enter another competition. This competition was not about me, it was about helping others. I entered the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Man Woman of the Year competition. Anybody familiar with it? Yeah, it's kind of like a scam in a way because they say, oh, if you raise the most money, you get to be named Man of the Year. So what does it do for me? It's competitive, right? And I have what kind of mindset now? Champion. So if, like failure was not an option, right? But it really wasn't a scam. It's for an unbelievable purpose. And, um, and in a 10-week period, with my wife by my side and a team of about 30 people, we raised $109,000 for leukemia in 10 weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Ironically, the name of the organization was called Champions for Cures that we created because it was all about the mindset. So what I'm going to share with you today is some of the things that I believe that separates from a contender mindset to a championship mindset. There may be some things you want to write down, maybe some things you don't, but hopefully one thing will stick, and if you leave here and apply it in 72 hours, then we're going to be in good shape. Are you with me? Very good. Okay, the first thing is a contender has potential. But guess what a champion does? Maximizes the potential. So as a competitor, there is, there is no doubt in my mind looking back, I had the skill set to become world champion in Taekwondo. There's no question. There is no question in my mind that I was amongst the best and could be the best. But I never maximized potential. And again, it's not that I worked hard. I know a lot of everybody, everybody out here, I'm sure you work really hard. But ask yourself, are you truly maximizing your personal potential? That's the question that I'm hoping that you're going to ponder and think about. And then hopefully, by the time you put place and action to maximize it. A content is happy with placing. You can see why I put this one up there. <laughs> and then a champion strives for first. And if I look back again, I'm at that thing. My coach said, hey, only two more fights for gold. I'm like, oh, great. But it really didn't matter to me because I meddled. But at that fundraising campaign for leukemia and lymphoma, especially when it was for somebody else and not me, there was no question. My wife pretty much said, if you win, I'm leaving you. <laughs> not really, but kind of. <laughs> okay. Uh, contender focuses other people is doing. And then, what does a champion do? I kind of gave you the secret. <laughs> Focuses on winning. And this is really important. You think about this whole mountain biking scene, right? And I'm riding, and the only thing I looked at was the people in front of me. If I looked this way or looked that way, it took my eyes off the prize. In the fundraising campaign, I focused on my objective, which my objective was to raise a thousand dollars. That was my goal. That was my objective. dollars. Collectively, I said as an organization group, I said and strive to raise five hundred thousand dollars. We ended up raising five hundred nine thousand dollars collectively. But I was focused on the hundred thousand dollars. And I, I said, look, if I raise over a hundred and I don't win the competition, I think I still won. Not really. <laughs> You with me on this? Uh, this is for business. I believe this is really important. A competitor, I'm sorry, a contender lives on the competitive plane. And then a, a champion lives on the creative plane. How much energy is spent when you're focusing on what your competition is doing? Awareness is good. Inundating yourself with what others are doing is a distraction. I believe we only have a certain amount of mental energy. And if our mental energy is going side to side, there's not going to be enough in reserve to focus on what you want to accomplish. So for all those, been any business owners out there? No business owners out there? Anybody who runs their own business? Entrepreneurs? I urge you. 
to work on your own creative juices, your own creativity, to, right? To do a better job at what you're doing and kind of like a racehorse who's running a race, what do they have to put on their eyes? They put on the blinders. So they only focus on where they're gonna go. In the martial arts industry, which is where we're from, that's our origin, um, we, both Paul and I own multiple schools in the other side of New York. Everybody ever hear of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mean the Jersey side of New York? Um, we own multiple, and then the martial arts industry is booming. There are schools all over the place. There's a school that opened up within a mile, actually, just a couple of months ago, a school opened up across the street from my main location. I was like, whoa. For about 30 seconds, I was like, what the heck's wrong with this guy? Does he know who I am? <laughs> but <laughs> actually, that is what went on through my mind. <laughs> but the reality is, I didn't really care. Because if I put my energy on what he's doing, it's going to take away from my client base, my creativity, and providing the best possible service and program for the students who entrust in me. That's why we have to focus and live on the creative plane. And that's where you're going to be able to innovate better ideas, out-of-the-box ideas, to take your business, organization, or passion to a whole new level. Are you with me here? Yes? Okay, very good. Uh, a contender follows others. Kind of like the same thing. And a champion blazes the path. Just because somebody can do it for you doesn't mean you can't make it happen. You understand that? Just because somebody else didn't do it before doesn't mean you can't make it happen because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it and you're going to say, I wish I did it. You got to blaze the path. You have to, you have to create. You know, go to, what, what does Star Trek say? Go to a place where no man's gone before. Or woman now, right? We have to be politically correct. Okay. Contenders are motivated. Who's motivated? Did we motivate you yet today? Yes? Are you a little bit motivated? Yeah. Can I have a little response? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you were in our martial arts school, you'd be saying yes, sir, and being really loud, but it's okay. It's your first lesson, okay? But champions are inspired. Not that motivation is not good. Inspiration is a little bit more powerful. Let me explain why. Motivation is temporary. Inspiration is permanent. We try on a daily basis to motivate ourselves, to motivate our families, to motivate our clients and Empowered Mastery, to motivate our martial arts students. At this level, we're motivating our staff to do a better job. We try. Oh, did I say that? Jim? We do. Thank you. All right. I wish the guy in the back would just be quiet a little bit. <laughs> but we work hard at motivating them on a daily basis, motivating ourselves, motivating other people. But we work harder to inspire them to do things that they've never done before. Do you understand the difference? When we have somebody who's going to work black belt, we motivate somebody in every class that we teach them. We motivate them to kick higher. We motivate them to punch harder. We motivate them. But Jim was inspired to be a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He was not motivated every day to get to class. So motivation is something you have to do for yourself every single day, but you have to be inspired and have to get inspired. But whatever you're going to do is bigger than you. Whatever you're going to do has a greater purpose. When I went for Leukemia Lymphoma Society, Man of the Year, do you think it was bigger than me? Especially when you have a story attached. When there's a story attached and there's a strong why, you're going to do things that way out of your comfort zone. I'll show you that story in a minute. Contenders, look at the obstacles. The champion sees themselves at the finish line. There's a story I heard a long time ago. It was between a millionaire and a billionaire. Big difference, right? The millionaire to the billionaire, how did you do it? How did you become a billionaire? And the billionaire said, here we go. Let me give you an example. If we had, we were here, and there's this big body of water, and there's land on the other side, that's safety. And there's man-eating sharks in that body of water. 
See, a millionaire is going to look at the sharks and try to navigate through the sharks. Me, I already see myself on the other side. I was like, wow, that's powerful. Is that powerful? And by the way, that's powerful. Right? So a champion sees themselves at that level of success way ahead of, they see themselves achieving whatever they set out to do way ahead of time. Whereas contenders are going to go from obstacle to obstacle and they focus on the obstacles. But when you focus on the big picture and keep your eyes focused there, that's what you're going to work towards. That's what you're going to get. And then those obstacles seem so little. Has anybody in their past had a challenge, let's say five, ten years ago, that you look back at that and you're like, wow, that was nothing compared to what I'm doing now. You know what I mean? That's the perfect example. The obstacles seem ginormous, but if you keep your eyes on what your big picture is, what your purpose is, what your worthy ideal is, then the obstacles become non-existent and they're just like little stepping stones to get to the bigger picture. Are you with me on this? Very good. Thank you. Good response. Okay. A contender practices consistently. A champion trains as if it's the... You ever hear of Mayumuro Musashi? Anybody not hear of Mayumuro Musashi? <laughs> okay, very good. Mayumuro Musashi, i the name right, but he wrote the Book of Five Rings. Anybody ever read the Book of Five Rings? Very good. One person. It's two. All right. Mayumuro Musashi was one of the most decorated warriors in ancient Japan. Uh, ancient Japan. And back then, in Taekwondo now, you're going to fight for points. You're going to try to hit this big chest protector. In Jiu Jitsu, you're going to do what you guys do <laughs> against a competitor. <laughs> I don't know anything about it, sorry. But you're going to compete and it's safe. You have a referee, you have a judge. Back then, he like battled for his life. And if he didn't win, he died. And he survived over 60 life or life and death battles. And he wrote the Book of Five Rings to share his experiences and his philosophy. And his philosophy was something that I've adopted my whole life, especially later years, is I always train as if it's the event. Because then when it's actually, when it's actually the event, you've already been through it. Does everybody understand that? Always train as if it's the event. And when it's the actual event, you've already gone through it, so you're mentally and physically and emotionally prepared. Really good lesson. I highly recommend you read that book. And a contender, think about winning. Yes, I'm going to win. I'm gonna win. But a champion feels the victory. So I'm going to take a moment and share the story on why I went for Man of the Year in Leukemia Lymphoma Society. So my son, I've always been supporting Leukemia LLS for many years. I've had some young students who have been um, diagnosed and uh, really touched my heart. And we've raised probably over the last, since 2012, probably as an organization, over $200,000, $250,000 for LLS. So really, you know, commendable, I think. Um, but we always went to the same well. And my son, actually, who runs one of my locations, is talking to the, to the audience at one of our belt testing. And he's talking to them about this, and we're doing this small fundraiser. And I'm feeling nervous. Anybody ever go to the same well too much? Right? I'm looking at the, the body language. I'm saying, wow, I don't know. Maybe we should stop this. My son did a great job. Then this gentleman comes up to me. And he says, Master Burlow? I go, yes. I didn't know him. He goes, I want to let you know my name is Jeff. He goes, I want to thank you for what you're doing for my stepdaughter. And more importantly, I want to thank you for what you're doing for LLS. And then he said to me, he goes, I have leukemia. Very stern. And then he says to me, and my son had leukemia. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? In my mind, right? I didn't say it out loud, right? And then I look at him, and I said, well, we did this for you. And I shook his hand. The next day, he sends me a long email, and he says to me, it's kind of hard for me to talk about, he says, I want to thank you again. I'm the gentleman that came up and talked to you, and I want to reiterate the importance that you're doing for Leukemia Lymphoma Society. He goes, my son Riley was 12 years old and passed away seven years ago from AML leukemia. 
And he goes, and I have been recently diagnosed with leukemia six months ago. It's a rare form, HCL. And he goes, the prognosis looks good, but nonetheless, I believe that I have been presented with this challenge to spread my son's, men uh, my son's message. And he says, and I'm going to do everything I can in my power to make sure that nobody, no parent is ever going to hold their child for their last breath. And I was like, I'm in. And that right there is when I accepted the nomination for the Man of the Year competition and committed to raise that much money. Do you think I had a strong why? Did it hit from my heart? If you have a strong why, it hits you at the heart, you think you're going to go overcome any obstacle that's in front of you? There were no obstacles. There were only solutions because it was much bigger than me. That is why, anybody, um, the name of the organization is called Champions for Cures. And there was a client and friend that I had the honor to work with a long time, still very, uh, very, fr very close friends, and, and I have so much respect for him. And he's in our audience, Carl Lutz, where are you? Right, so Carl would send me some emails and mess some inspirational stuff every so often, go back and forth. And he says to me, he goes, my wife shows this video to her kindergarten class every morning to inspire them, and I thought you would enjoy it. And it was right at the time when I was nominated for right, or that competition. It's like, wow, this is unbelievable. And the name of the song is called The Champion by Carrie Underwood. Anybody ever hear of it? Okay, now I want to first have a full disclosure. I'm a seventh degree. I have a pretty good accolade of competitiveness, so don't judge me by my music. All right? I'm not a Carrie Underwood fan, okay? Just, we have that for the record. But I want you to look at the words here. Is this your favorite song? Well, Carrie Underwood is one of my favorite songs. But is it your favorite song? I have other favorite songs. What's your favorite song? I don't want to say. Are you sure? Does anybody like the Frozen song? Or is it just me? Right, thank you. Raise your hand if you like the Frozen song. So now I'm really being judged. <laughs> What's your favorite, se your second favorite song? He's really killing me. Anybody like Les Mis? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm sorry, anyway. go back to your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Just want to put things in perspective. Thank you. <laughs> That's what you have when you have a lifelong partner, a <laughs> lifelong, <laughs> lifelong friend. All right, anyway, look at the words. I am a champion. I want you to relate. We have this to all the things that I talked about so far. I am invincible, unbreakable, unstoppable, and unshakable. And think about a time in your life when you felt like this, or what it would mean to feel like this moving forward. They knock me down. I get up again. I am the champion. Who's been knocked down before? Right, you have a choice. You get knocked down and you can get back up. I don't think that's an option. And I think from our audience, that's not even in, in your wheelhouse. You're gonna know my name. Anybody who is at the highest level at whatever you do, do you know who it is? Do you know who it is? Whatever part, organization, or whatever you're part of, you know who the top players are. You know them right, right away by name. So you're gonna know my name, right? Mountain biking, they knew who I was. Also, because I walked right up and went right back in that spot, right? Man of the Year competition, they knew who I was, right? You can't hurt me now. I can't feel the pain. Yes, I was born to win. Now think about it. Think about that story of my, uh, the, the millionaire and the billionaire, right? When you have that key objective, when you have that focus, when you have that purpose, did I have obstacles in that Man of the Year campaign? Absolutely. It's a 10-week campaign. Week number seven, I had raised $30,000. Week number seven, I had three weeks to raise $70,000. That's a lot, right? You know what I mean? But I had my eyes still set, and we ended up exceeding the goal by 10%, right? I was made for this year, I was born to win, I am the champion. So what I'd like to do right now 
is to share with you this video because it inspired me in many different, and I thank Carl all the time. Every morning I would wake up as I was going through this campaign, I would say to myself, I am so happy and grateful now that I raised $100,000 for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I'm so happy and grateful now. That's how I conditioned my mind, and I felt the victory. I didn't just think it. Is everybody with me on this? Okay. So I want you to watch this, and then let's see if you catch why this really resonated with me for the campaign. I'll be the last one standing, two hands in the air, I'm a champion. You'll be looking up at me when it's over. I live for the battle, I'm a soldier. Yeah, I'm a fighter like Rocky. Put your flag on your back like Ali. Yeah, I'm the greatest, I'm stronger. Bet my dues, can't lose, I'm a own. I possess through the drama. H is for the hurt, but it's all for the honor. A is for my attitude, working through the patience. Money comes and goes, so the M is for motivation. Gotta stay consistent, the P is to persevere. The I is for integrity, innovative career. The O is optimistic, open and never shut. And the N is necessary, cause I'm never giving up. See, they ask me how I did it, I just did it from the heart. Crushing the competition, been doing it from the start. They say that every champion is all about his principles. Carry Thank you, Carl. So, why do you think that resonated with me? You are absolutely that guy walking. Just wanted to get on the mountains, but obviously, it was the cancer patients fighting the battle because I believe that they're the ones that are the true champions because they're facing the battle of their lives, right? Every morning, who has Alexa? Nobody has Alexa. Alexa is Alexa the best? person ever. I would walk down every morning and I would say, Alexa, first thing, put on the champion. And you know what? She listened. <laughs> it doesn't happen in my house much, but she listened, right? 
And then I would go right to my journal after champion every single morning. I'm so happy and grateful now that I've raised $100,000 for LLS. And what I do now is I write down in my journal, if I could raise $100,000 for LLS in 10 weeks, I could do anything. Right? So I'm still holding on, emotionally connected to that experience. And it's still bigger than me. And I hope that story inspires you to do more, to be more, and so you ultimately could have more. When I say have more, I think have more experiences with the people you care about and love the most. Are you with me on this? Okay. I'm going to close up with a contender lives in the comfort zone. Jim talked about that a little bit, a little while ago. But a champion follows the four Ds. But I've taken enough time up here today, so I'd like to introduce my other half. Um, he's not my better half. My wife's my better half. But my other half, my business partner, Empowered Mastery, this is Grandmaster Paul Malal. I want to tell you a little bit about Paul. Number one, he's the owner and operator of four United Martial Arts Center schools that he owns with his brother. He started his business a little bit before I did, but he's made tremendous, tremendous impact on his students and his students' lives to the point where we are here today. Um, he is owner of multiple commercial, again, with his brother. So our model is that we buy the real estate and put our schools in our real estate so we're paying ourselves rent rather than paying somebody else rent. Makes sense? Very good. Um, he is Putnam County's 40 under 40 most influential business owners. He's not under 40 anymore. He's way past it, but it's an accolade that he likes me to mention. <laughs> okay. He's a coach of national taekwondo. His brother was a national champion at the age of 16 that he coached him. Right? He was able to give him that championship mindset. And he's coached a lot of individuals in the financial services to achieve the highest level in that industry. Right? But it's all about the championship mindset. He is a 2014 U.S. Mountain Bike National Champion. You know, we went to the same nationals. I was in a different division. He's like your best friend. He's like your brother. I competed. I was, like, favored to win. And I got a freaking hole in my tire. Like a big hole in my tire. I couldn't fix the tire and I had to walk down my bike. And on the way home, he won first place. I was the one that inspired him to do this competition, right? And every time he would make, he put the metal right on the wind, the, what do you call it, the mirror. And every time he made a left turn, the metal would go right in my face. Right in my face. Is that what best friends do, right? Turns, by the way, a lot of left turns. Yes. <laughs> He is currently a physique competitor. Just this past Saturday, I spent the day with him, watching him like just basically be up on stage like this, like with barely anything on, showing his muscles. Um, but if you saw the amount of discipline and the work that he puts into this, is unbelievable. He's got muscles. I didn't even know that muscles exist. I have the same thing, but it's just insulated. Okay. Anyway. And he is obviously the co-founder of our company, Empowered Master. I'd like to introduce to you my best friend, my business partner, and really the brother from another mother, Grandmaster Paul Malala. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Come on, give a big hand for Master, this is the Grandmaster quick, Chris Barolo. That's, that's the quick Bigger hand, bigger hand. Here's your markers. How many of you have ever felt like a contender before? Felt like a champion before. Thank you. How many of you want to feel like a champion all the time? Thank you. Again, my name is Grandmaster Paul I am humbled and honored to be here. We are the owners and operators of Empowered Mastery and the co authors of the best selling book, You Have Infinite. I first want to thank AAG and James, Matt, Steve for allowing us to be here today. I also want to thank you, the audience. I believe that anyone that invests their time, energy, and money into their personal, professional growth is in the top 5% of the most successful people in the world. So please give yourselves a big hand. You have my 110% commitment to take whatever's inside me over the next, say, 40 minutes or so and transfer it to you. I abs absolutely love teaching this content 
and this information. But what if I were to tell you that there are some simple strategies and steps that once taught, once applied into your life, you can think, feel, and act like a champion producer, a champion spouse, a champion leader, and for those who are, champion parents. How many people would be interested in that? Thank you. For the past 25 years, I have the honor of traveling around the world, literally studying some of the most influential leaders, coaches, and trainers that talk peak, uh, peak potential, performance, not only in business, but in life. I've literally spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into my personal and professional growth, and that information has came back to me more than 10 times. I have now the honor of traveling around the country and not only teaching in our martial art organization thousands of children and families, but now going out into industries, companies, working with people that would never walk into our martial arts schools. And I'm talking, it's, we've been, and we've literally taught inner city kids in Queens, New York, kids with like cigar burns on their hands that didn't think they were even, even a contender let alone a champion, to top executives probably like yourselves here. And what I'm more importantly that I'm proud about is not only allowing them to think like a champion in business and reach levels of success in different areas of their life, but more importantly, teaching them to be a champion in all aspects of their life. We define that as multi-dimensional success. Now, what I will share with you is I currently have clients and have had clients that are millionaires, multi-millionaires, but yet they may not be in the best relationships with their significant other. I've had clients that were physically fit externally, but yet they didn't really know about true health and vitality, constantly getting sick. And when you're sick, what ends up happening is you lose time. And when you lose time, you can, that's the one thing you and I can never, ever get what? Back. And then I have clients that are so-called spiritual. We have clients up here in Buffalo that are very spiritually connected to their creator. And we also have clients down in Brooklyn that have a different faith and very spiritually connected. But yet they can't pay their bills. I don't know about you in the audience, but I don't believe that any of that is success. Now, I am not here to define success for you. Only you can define that definition. But what I will share with you is that I believe success should be experienced in multiple areas of your life and should be also in alignment with what we call in our book, You Have Infinite Power, a worthy ideal. Now, that's not our talk, but I'm sure you heard of people sharing what their why is. And that, I believe, is a level of fulfillment. Now, Chris did raise over $109,000 in 10 weeks, and that goal was a part of his worthy ideal, which was a driving force, an emotional force, to have him overcome things, even his own little voices, for him to achieve that goal. But it was congruent with his worthy ideal. What I will say is I may ask a lot of Thank you. I may leave a word off the end of the thank you. And I may ask you to, I don't know, Chris uses the funny songs and stuff. But in any event, how many want to get the most out of today? Thank you. Well, my teaching style is called accelerated learning. What's it called? So I'm not here to talk to you or at you. I, we want to inspire, lead, and impact you by engaging. Is that OK? All right, so what I will share with you is that everything that you and I have in our life is a result. What is it? Thank you. So we know this in the physical world, don't we? Right? We know this in the physical world. This could potentially be our tree of life. What's it called? Thank you. And some of my coaching clients that are in the audience, they kind of have seen this multiple times. But we know that in our tree of life, there are multiple fruit that you and I bear. 
Uh, maybe it is our income or our production in business. Maybe it is our health, right? Whether you can define that in weight or in internal vitality. Uh, uh, it is our relationships, meaning our significant other, right? Husband, wives, partners, spouses. And then maybe this is our family. If you have children or if you don't have children, I'm going to say this is your family, right? Now, when we look at our tree of life, you may or may not be happy with these results. You take a look and be like, ha, I've been only a, a, I've in, been able to develop this much income. I was never able to break this level of production or increase this much more revenue this year. We take a look at our health and we're like, I lost 20 pounds, but I gained it all right back. How many can relate, yes? Yeah? And then, um, uh, I keep on uh, attracting that same type of woman in my life. Oh yeah, I wonder why, okay? And then uh, you're either happy or happy with the time that you're spending with your family or your children. I wish I could spend more time with my children. How many can relate that one of the pieces of the fruit on my tree of life? Thank you. Here's what we do know. In the physical world, all of these things were once a what? A seed that you and I planted a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, or maybe it was a seed that was planted by somebody else. Your parents, your grandparents, maybe your coaches or your teachers. It was the seed that whether you consciously or unconsciously planted in your mind. You take a look at your results and you are not what? Happy. Or maybe you are happy. This one has a worm. This one is rotten. This one falls down. This one doesn't grow. Now what grows easily and effortlessly around my tree? Weeds. Yeah, it's not even the stuff that's legal in uh, Massachusetts, okay? We'll be in New York soon, I think. And anyway, weeds, you know what? The weeds are the negative people that you and I listen to. The weeds are the the things that we The weeds are also the what? Voices that you and I allow to talk to us. I believe you have at least two voices in your head. Some of you in the room go, who the hell does this guy think he is? I don't have two voices in my head. Do you know the one that just said that? <laughs> That's the little voice I'm talking about. So yeah, I know we have at least two. There is a contender voice, and there is a champion voice inside all of us. If you're like me, I have way more than two voices in my head. How many know what I'm talking about, yes? Awesome. But these weeds don't go what? Away. I know it's fall now, but like in April, May, when the weather starts breaking, you know, I have the landscapers come and they kind of clean up my property. And then I, they do the, all the weeding around the house. A week or two later, what the hell? I'm like, Todd, were you just here weeding? Paul, we were just there. I go, well, it looks like it's a freaking rainforest in my backyard. The weeds don't go what? You know what we have to be? You and I have to be the landscapers of our mind. My coaching clients, I say, do not think that uh, this is a diet coaching program. Diets don't work. People go on diets, they go what? Off diets. I have a lifestyle. My coaching clients, I want to inspire them to have a lifestyle of what? Thinking. This stuff doesn't go away. And so I challenge you to be the landscapers of your mind. And now how that starts is that you and I become aware. Oh, what's the word? Aware. aware. Thank you. Aware of what? Well, of course, we're aware of either the what? Our results in our tree of life. This is where you and I have to be completely honest with ourselves, right? And I'm not talking about that one scale that tells you that you're a little bit lighter. I'm the, the real scale. I'm talking about like I go to the doctor and I get the full-blown expensive body scan to tell me how much body fat I have. 
right? Because I don't want to go to the one in the gym that tells me that I'm better than I think I am. You know what I'm talking about, yes? And we all have that mirror that we're like, I look good in this one. I like this one. But it's not the real mirror. You know what I'm talking about. You have to be aware. You got to be aware of where you currently are in your health. It's like jumping on the I'm like, huh, okay, I am this much weight. I am this much weight. I am this much body fat. Okay, and you got to be honest. Where are you in your relationships? Where are you in your relationships? I mean, I'm really in that intimate relationship. Do you feel like I go on dates with my wife every weekend? I have meetings with my wife every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Where are you in your what? Family time. How much time do you spend with your children if you have them or your parents if they're still alive? I, my, thir- my daughter is uh, going to be, oh, she's 13. How many more times is she going to allow me to put her to bed at night? You know, is it one more year? You know, if there's 52 weeks in the year, I get to do that once or twice a week, I got to, what, 100 more times to do that? What if you count it down like that? You see your parents once a month, twice a year, and they're what, 70, 80? I mean, how many more times do you have? Be realistic. And then what is your personal income? Where are you in production? You gotta know the numbers. You're going to be aware of where you are and no lying. But more importantly, you've got to be aware of what is in your head. I do this exercise of creating voices for my clients. I'm going to share with your permission. I have several voices in my head. But I want you to think about how this works. Because once you can identify and become aware of the voice, you can fight it. If you fight blind, it's really hard, isn't it? But if you know what you're up against, it's so much easier. I have three negative voices. As I share my stories, you're probably going to what? Create your own voices right here in the audience. I have an easy target Paul. He's seven years old. He's short. He's still short. He's bullied. He's not athletic. He has zero confidence. He gets his butt kicked all the time by a kid named Tommy Gonzalez. Picks on him every single day. I have second best Paul. Second best Paul, because of easy target Paul, my parents put me in martial arts at seven years old. And I trained for martial arts for six months privately, no one knew, it was top secret. I get off the bus, I run (laughs) right to my house, because it was like this long road off the bus, because I was getting my butt kicked every day. And then I put on my uniform, my parents would take me to martial arts class. Six to eight months goes by, this kid Tommy Gonzalez attempts to pick on me, I get off the bus, we're on Cherry Lane where my parents grew up, and uh, next to this kid's house, Matt Musicar, he was an older little Jewish boy but had no confidence, he he let me get beat up, and uh, Tommy attempted to pick on me, kind of stepped back, and I did a fake logo high, popped him in his nose, never picked me ever again, we became childhood best friends, I was his best man in his wedding, ironically I was his best man in his second wedding. True story. I thank him because if he didn't, I would have never been where I am today. That led me into competition. And then just like Chris, I competed and state level, winning state championship, state championship, but I'd go to nationals and I'd always fall short. I was the youngest on my team. Chris was in the middle. I was the lightest on my team. You ever, you ever see the movie Seabiscuit? That, that, that horse guy, it's like that he was like the, tr- the one that would always lose to go train the thoroughbred. I kind of felt like that growing up as a kid. My coach kind of like neglected me, looked at me like younger. And I would go to nationals like Chris, and we just realize this stuff later on in life as we share our stories. And I'm like, I felt second best. When I got to the medal rounds, I too, like him, was happy with just being a contender placing second or third. 
And that's second best Paul. He just settled. He was comfortable. He was a contender. Never really thought he was good enough. Now, there's, excuse my French, wise-ass Paul. He's about 15, 16. He's super skinny because he has to lose weight all the time. And everyone, his friends, would be working out, athlete, athletes, work really fit. And they would tease me. Take off your shirt, Paul, around the girls. Take off your shirt. I was so embarrassed taking my shirt off. So I had to be wise guy to show that I'm what? Tough. And pick fights with people. Those voices, I gave you a what? I'm aware of a 7-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 15-year-old. I gave them a negative name and experience. They're disempowering. When I am aware of that voice that doesn't believe he or she, he's not good enough, I picture that 7-year-old kid. Now, if a 7-year-old kid or 11-year-old kid walked up to you and said, you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're going to fail, nah, 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 you can't do it, what would you do? You'd probably laugh at it, right? Shove it away, right? Ignore it, right? Most of us in the room, we don't do that. We actually allow it to talk and dominate our mind. How many know what I'm talking about? How many of you have a negative voice that you can identify right now? When you can identify that, you can almost shrink it down and laugh at it. I have three empowering voices. My first one is Master Malella. He was designed at 21 years old. Master Malella took on this identity. I'm confident, I'm strong, I'm a leader. I inspire other kids to not be bullied like I was, to be confident, to believe in themselves. Now it's Grandmaster Malella, which we just got back from Korea in April, and we, I didn't want anything grand in front of my name, but that's just the way our levels go. I have a new identity now. I have Perfect Paul. Perfect Paul said, never again am I going to be second what? Never again. I became a champion. I trained other national competitor champions, which is very hard to do. And I said, I'm going to be a champion in business. We, like most industries, have these conventions, and we both declare we're going to come back the top 10 martial arts schools in the, in the industry. And Chris and I did. We would go to these national conventions in Orlando, Florida with other martial art professionals, and we were going back and forth to number one, number two, number one, number two, number one, school in the country, number two. I was more number one than he was number two. <laughs> no matter what I did, I said, I am going to be a champion. And now this, you're getting also inspire, passionate Coach Paul right now to go out and be an inspiration for other professionals and leaders to be the best versions of themselves every single day. I've got these voices, and this is how powerful it is, ladies and gentlemen. Chris did share, yes, I was a national champion mountain biker, but I was only going for him. When I turned 40, he goes, we have to do something epic. Let's do an Xterra, an off-road triathlon. Anyone know what that is? Right? So great, okay, all right. Uh, I have to swim. I don't know how to swim. So I have to hire a coach. So this woman taught me how to swim. I was like this. I said, oh, okay, I can mountain bike and I can condition my running. Let's do these mountain bike races, he said. It'll help us get ready for this Xterra championship. Wow, okay, you sure? So yeah, we started winning. He was winning his class, I was winning my class. I didn't realize it, we were ranked. He was ranked number one in the country. I didn't know it, we go to the nationals, USA Cycling Mountain Bike Cross Country Nationals in PA. Beautiful mountain, big bear, black bear, I forget what it is. Ski resort. And I was, didn't know it, I was ranked eight. So they call out all the one through 10, and here's this number one ranked guy. He's, I called him, in my head I called him GQ. What would I call him? I think I'm a handsome guy. This guy was strappingly handsome. I'm talking, okay, he's like, I, like I'm five foot six, I wish, uh, maybe five foot six and <laughs> half. He's six foot, got the, you know, the father clock shadow, dark skin, the hair, the matching black outfit, this bike, you know, I'm like, you know, you would size everybody up, right? Everyone sizes everybody up. And I'm like, oh crap, it's the number one guy. He's 
goes right up like a thoroughbred, up the front. Then they call the two, three, four. And number eight, Paul Malala from Putnam Valley, New York. I'm eight? So I get to go in the front, but off to the left. Red light. Beep. Yellow light. Beep. Green light. Go! Out the gate. GQ, first. All my other races, I'm always first. He goes, you're going to be first out the gate. I was not first. One, two, three, I was four. Out of the gate. We go into the single track. That's the little what? Path into the woods. I go fourth. I, this, is not, this is a true story. My front brake, the bolt, comes out. My front brake falls. Easy target Paul's like, you're gonna die. <laughs> you're dead. You gotta go up the mountain. What are you gonna do after you go up the mountain? I'm Down. I'm dead. There's rocks everywhere. He gets excited when you go almost die. I don't get excited when I almost die. <laughs> now I have life. I'm smart. Go in. All of a sudden, like a sparring match, man. I swear. I hear Master Malala, you don't give up. You teach people to persevere. You get back in there. He's the target ball. You're going to die. Second best ball. Oh, my God, you're fourth. You're not even in the podium. And then it's like back and forth, back and forth. And here's the third place guy. And I'm like, yeah. And then perfect Paul, you've been training your butt off. You get in there. You love the hills. Attack the hills. Attack the hills. I'm like, attack the hills. Attack the hills. Attack the hills. And I'm talking out loud. And then the guy behind me is like, thinks I'm talking at him. And then it was working. I'm like, yeah, get out of the way, man. I'm on you. I'm on you. And he goes, Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Boom. Now I'm number three. Oh, yeah, this is working. I'm going to start talking smack to this guy now. All right, all right, here we go. All right, get out of the way. Man, I'm on you. I'm on you. Get out of the way, man. I love the hills. I love the hills. I'm a goat. I'm a goat. I'm... And I, I start talking out loud. That guy gets nervous. Boom. Oh, yeah. Who's in front of me? GQ. And I'm like, then I'm going, he's from Florida. There's no hills in Florida. I got this guy. You know, I'm like semi-retired. I'm training all, I'm like training, it's like three hours a day, four hours a, a day. I go all the way up to the top of the mountain. Thank God I had no breaks. There was one rock garden that we were practicing the day before. And my man just misses one. I'm talking like a little slip. Right in front of him. I just sat back and I felt like the devil himself was on my ass. And I just, as hard as I could, hard as I could, hard as I could, I couldn't tap the brake. And when I got, when I saw the, the finish line, I did one of these. Nobody was even next to me. He didn't even podium. I crushed him mentally. And when I crossed that finish line, I didn't have my wife and kids there on purpose. I'm not going to lie. I didn't believe I was going to win. Second best Paul was talking smack to me all the way up into that race. I had to beat him up. The first person I call is my dad. I tell the story a lot. And I got on the phone and said, Pop, you have two national champions. My brother was one. I never, ever, ever felt jealous of my younger brother. When he won, I won. And I said, it's not through Taekwondo, but you have a 40-year-old USA mountain bike national champion. That medal was for my dad. And what I'm here to tell you is that you've got to be aware of those voices because those voices will dictate your outcome. How many can relate to what I'm saying right now? You. Champions have to be clear. What do they have to be? You have to know specifically what you want. If it's October, you're going to know exactly what you want to see happen from now to the end of the year. Or if it's going to 2020, what exactly do you want for the next year? I asked, I'm like famous for asking, well, what do you want? Here, one person. I don't know. That's the reason why you don't get it, because you just don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You're going to know what you want. I get another. Well, I don't 
be broke. I don't want to be overweight. I don't want to be alone. I didn't ask you what you didn't want. I asked you what you what? Wanted. And then I get someone to say, well, I want to make more. Oh, yeah? Here's a dollar. More money. Oh, yeah? You lost an ounce. Champions are clear. So I'm asking you, what do you want? But not only what you want, what is ideal for you? What is ideal from now till the end of December? What is ideal for you? How are you going to finish this race strong? How are you going to finish this fight strong in 2019? What specific do you want to see happen? What is ideal for you? Not what you don't want. Just general. And don't give me any BS like you don't know what specifically do you want. If you have a pen and paper, you should be writing it down. And if it's like, oh, I know, I know already, Paul. Write down those goals every single what? Day. Who wins? Who wins? They do. Who wins? You have the common people that just say, oh, I have a New Year's resolution. Then you have like other people go, oh, I have a goal, and I write it down once. They don't look at it all year until next January. You want the champion mindset? People? Every day. Chris, he wrote it down every single day. Get clear. Deal. Use the four D's. And the first side, what's the word? Most people can't make a decision. This is the hardest thing to do. You know, he said, yeah, I'm a physique competitor now. I wasn't a physique competitor, just only last year. I hired a, a 23-year-old trainer. Do you think I need to hire a 23-year-old trainer? I've been working out all my life. A coach is also has coaches. So here's the story. I train with this kid, Steve, he's 23. His boss is my coaching client. We just did a seminar for him. And he's in the, my, my uh, training session. So he looks at me, and he's like a good-looking, young, vanilla kid, you know, like nice. And he's like, so, Paul, what are you going to do this year? I'm like, oh, I'm going uh, to open up another business. I'm in the process of buying another building. I got asked to write another book, and I start calling him what I'm going to do. Now, please do not don't say I'm thinking I'm bragging. And I'm going to get to why I say things out loud. I say things out loud for a specific reason I'll get to. But he goes, no, 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 no. I'm your trainer. What are you going to do health-wise? Oh, I'm going to run another half marathon, and we're going to probably do another 200-mile relay race, a Ragnar race. He goes, well, didn't you do that before? I'm like, mother. <laughs> this guy's calling me out my own stuff. I go, of course I did that. He goes, well, Paul, you just told me you want to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I go, I say that. So what are you going to do to get uncomfortable? I go, I don't know. <laughs> He goes, well, you just told me to get uncomfortable and make a decision. So what do you got, hotshot? He goes, do a physique show. I go, I'm not wearing no bikini then. He goes, no, 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 physique is surfer shorts. I can get away with surfer shorts. This is February. He goes, I go, show right now, Steve. Boop, boop, boop. On his phone. He goes, I found one. I go, make it before Memorial Day so I can have, have this big Memorial Day party. I go, so I look at for Memorial Day party. He goes, I got one. That weekend. And right then and there, I made a what? I made a decision. Right there. I go, I'm in. And what I said is, then and there, I create a goal card. And Chris alluded to it earlier. A goal card is something that you write out, and some of our business cards are like this. Hey, being grateful now that. Now that I weigh 157 pounds and 4% body fat. Now I was 20 pounds heavier 
and probably about 10% body fat heavier. But I, I said it every single day. You have to champion, what does it do? Feels it. You ever order something? I'm so excited, like something in the mail. That's kind of like what this is. You have to feel as if it already what? Arrived. So I have my clients, they tell the truth in advance. Everyone say it. Tell the truth in advance. And you write it out like a declaration or a card. And this is the first time make a decision. If you have a decision on what you want for the next two and a half months, write it down. And tell the truth in advance advance. The next thing is declare. What's the word? Declare. Right away, I am constantly declaring what I'm doing. I am not bragging. When I declare something, I'm helping myself hold myself right then and there. Coach Steve said, I found a show. I got on the phone. I registered right then and there. And I posted it right then and there all over social media. Now, I would have to look like a complete you-know-what if I don't do it. Because now everyone's like, hey, Paul, how, are you, how's your training going? So I declared I was going to Korea. That's what this is. I declared I was running a half marathon. I declared I blew my knee out. ACL meniscus, the day after I got back from my knee surgery, I went on, I signed for a half marathon, and I posted it six months out to declare this is what I was going to do. Like, you're crazy. At the time, I was 42. They're like, you're not going to do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. I go, oh, yeah? Watch me. Because I have to back just like everybody what? else. And you declare it. So my coaching clients, I have them send a declaration email out. And so whatever it may be, I don't care. Wait. Steve or Steve? An email at my boot camp, our boot camp that he was going to run, I think it originally was a 5K, and then he changed it to a half marathon. He actually elevated the whole goal, the goal card in the declaration, and he sent it out right then and there uh, that he's going to sign up and do a marathon. He just completed it last week. Give him a big hand. And he said this to me. He goes, you know what? I got this competitive thing back. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You get that contender mindset in life, you have a contender mindset in business. You have a champion mindset in health, you can have it in business, or vice versa. And now he's rewiring his what? What I call his internal thermostat. We're all wired a certain way, you realize that, right? It's like the, the what, what do you think the temperature is in this room? Like 100 it feels like. <laughs> Jim, right? I don't know. Anyway, if it was, that would be me. If the temperature was on 100, the AC would kick on. If it was cold, the heat would kick on. But it's already set at what? That temperature. Unless we're not happy with it, we got to physically go over there and reprogram it, don't we? Each one of us already programmed in our health. We're programmed in our production. We're programmed in our income. We're programmed in the time we spend with our family. Unless someone goes in there and rewires it and we helped him rewire it and now he's beginning to have a champion mindset hopefully in other areas of his life but you say hey dear friend i'm sending you this email because i respect appreciate you and hope you hold me accountable you're basically telling them what you're going to do and now those people are going to ask hey matt how's that going hey jim how's that going he declared he was going to be a jujitsu black belt at one of our boot camps how many years ago Ten years ago. And he looked, he remembered. He goes, Chris, Paul, I got my black belt. Because he would look silly if he didn't get it after he declared it. How many people know what I'm talking about? So, for something, 72 hours, you decide, and you send a declaration email out. Whether you like him or not, someone says they're going to build something. What's oh, a big declaration? That's what we think. Okay. But it holds you accountable in a good way. Champions are disciplined. 
Jimmy Lake said to me, Paul, you're so disciplined. And my response was, everybody is disciplined. Every single one of you are disciplined. Everyone. I have friends that are really disciplined in their health. Like, it, they didn't wake up 350 pounds. They worked real hard to get 350 pounds. Right? They, they, they worked real hard to get divorced. They worked real hard to lose their business. They worked really hard to do that. Everyone is disciplined. You know what? Discipline are the things that you and I know we have to do every single what? Every day. You know it. I knew I had a meal prep. I knew I had to train. What I have my clients do is I have them create what I call an activity wheel, and they hone in on the things, if it's production-wise, what are the top five to seven, ten things that you have to do to generate that revenue? What is that hell yes action step? Otherwise, you don't do it over the next quarter. And they hone in like surgery, and they time block productive time. Only 70 to 80 percent of their day is allocated to that focused activity. Discipline matters. Reckless champion mindset. Who remembers Rocky? I'm talking the first Rocky. When he fought Apollo Creed, he wasn't even supposed to be there. He wasn't even supposed to be a contender. You remember at the end of that movie? Like Apollo was beating the crap out of him. But Rocky kept on getting what? That's discipline. Even though when you, if you knew, you think you're going to lose, you're getting back up. You know, there was that one scene after a while, he was like, it's like the end, and then Apollo shit, like got his hands in the air like he got it, and then Rocky gets back up. And all of a sudden, if you remember, Apollo Creed goes like this. His body's like a, nobody, nothing, nothing can stop a relentless, disciplined person. Relentless, disciplined person over and over and over. Relentless. On that mountain, I was relentless going after GQ. In my eating habits, relentless in my eating. You know how hard it is when all your friends are watching football, drinking beer, and like, Drinking water, eating cucumbers and grilled chicken. And all those guys that told me, Paul, take off your shirt. At 45 years old, I go, hey, Mike, take off your shirt. <laughs> Discipline, doing what needs to get done when you want to do it. Everyone is disciplined. So wake up late. Some people wake up early. Clients that are an uncommon club. I'm talking about five o'clock in the morning. They tell their empowering statements. Tell their coach that they're up and they're a part of my uncommon club. Hold them accountable. They got to work out. They got to meditate. They got to drink green tea, drink water before they start their day. That's discipline. Discipline in your own way. Or is dominate. Now you may think, oh, you want to dominate other people. I am very competitive. I want to dominate my competition. I want to dominate the guys on stage. I want to dominate those mountain guys. I want to dominate the guys in the, I used to spar. No, no, no. Dominate your what? Your mind. The hardest conversation you have is with those voices in your head. You walk around with him or her right now. You go to bed with him or her every single night. You wake up with him and her every single morning. That voice never goes what? Away. You have to be able to dominate your voice or your voices like me. Those voices never ever go away. And the only way you dominate them is by developing mind muscle exercises. Your mind is the most powerful tool that you have. I worked real hard physically to look a certain way this past Saturday. If I stop eating, stop training, my muscle in a matter of weeks, that days, will automatically what? 
go away. I'm talking about weeks and years, weeks and years, weeks and years, blew my knee out, atrophy in my leg, 30 something years kicking, gone, that fast. Your mind is a muscle. You feed it positive, inspiring messages, goal cards, statements. That's what makes your voices even what? Stronger. So that Grandmaster Malella voice kicks the crap out of Easy Target Paul. That second best Paul voice gets his butt kicked by perfect Paul. Because I work on my voice. I work on dominating my mindset. Are you a contender mindset or a champion mindset? When you leave this life experience and you go to whatever your belief is, heaven, whatever, and you go there and you walk up and they go, Matt, is that you? Oh. Hmm. 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 It says here, you were supposed to do this, accomplish this, inspire these people, do this, go here, go there, go there. Oh, you chose to be a contender, not a champion. So my wish for you as I leave this day is when you leave this seminar, this workshop, are you making a decision to be a contender or are you choosing to be a champion in production, a champion as a spouse, a champion in your health, a champion in a leader, a champion parent, and a champion in life? Are you deciding to be a champion. Thank you.